stand up South Africa. Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a common thing. Very good morning, Africa Zonga. Africa, Namsawe Nkwayo. My name is Titus Tungu, and this is the EFF podcast. We're coming to you from Winima Digzela Mandela House. And on today's episode, we dip into the matters of health, and I'll be in conversation with uh, Dr. Kaleng uh, Mufukeng, who is a medical doctor and the United Nations uh, Special Rapporteur. Dr. T, a very good morning to you and welcome to the EFF podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Titus. Very excited to be at the Winnie Mandigizela Mandela yeah, House. This is a revolutionary house. It's a revolutionary house <laughs> yeah. where revolutionary conversations happen. <laughs> sure, that's and, it. And yeah, I'm very yeah, excited yeah, to be perfect. having this conversation with you. Indeed. So let's just look at your career. Uh, you becoming, of course, a medical doctor. Would you say this has always been your childhood dream? I did not remember actually when I made the decision, okay. but I've always known I wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember back in school when your teachers yeah. keep asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I just keep saying doctor, doc. every year doctor, where oh, yeah. now? That's very inspiration in a, very, a, a very young person. Right? Like, they always say doctor, yeah. doctor. And they yeah. think, ah, it will change one day. Yeah. And then I keep saying, no, really, really, I want to be a doctor. And mm -hmm. they was just saying, you know, there are other careers. Yeah. Maybe you should read more and be inspired. I said, mm -mm, mm -hmm. I want to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's of course, as you grow up uh, and I in a Bantustan apartheid, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Puchadichaba. Mm -hmm. We, of course, were always around riots and uh, protests and all yes. of that. And I think perhaps part of that early thinking and, and formative years of my life mm -hmm. um, were influenced by the fact that I was surrounded by adults uh, oh, yeah. and who needed help and medical support. Mm -hmm. And I was always keen and, and, and happy to be participating in some form. Mm -hmm. And I think they just found me too young to really be part of protest okay. so they would give me the job of holding the water if someone comes running and they are injured you will then you know yeah. do something and i think that that's what actually got my mm -hmm. my passion um but also uh, understanding as a child um yeah. even at those early years of seven eight and nine mm -hmm. what it meant to be a child who's surviving apartheid in south africa so my my career my journey yeah. i think is very tied to the fact that i was born and raised in a bantustan former apartheid mm -hmm. uh, Putari Chama. Yeah. Against all odds, you were able to to rise and become uh, a medical doctor that you are. How has it been for you? Like, how is it, how is it like to be a doctor? It's one of my best moments, I think, of my time. Mm -hmm. I, I love seeing patients a lot, even though my current work and the phase I am in yeah. my career has been very much around human rights, about global mm -hmm. governance, mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, um, operating and working within institutions like the United Nations. Oh, yes. But even when I'm there, I still miss seeing patients, you know. And I have a dream one day uh, yeah. that I will run, you know, a community clinic somewhere mm -hmm. where, you know, people are self-sustaining yeah. and thriving and I can go and do yeah. life orientation and help <laughs> sure. the teachers. And yeah. when it's time to dissect, you know, in mm -hmm. biology, I'm there as well. You no, know, that's yeah. just my utopia, I suppose. Yeah, sure. But the yeah, the work the work is plenty, um, especially in the in the in the area of human rights. But also when you think about you know in the in the country that we are in, there's so many. Um, possibilities, right, mm -hmm. for people to be healthy and well. Yes. And and sometimes, especially because I'd worked in the public sector for so long, mm -hmm. I felt very frustrated, you know, that I, I knew I could do better for my patients, but I, I was operating in a system where yeah. that wasn't necessarily possible. And they say uh, one apple a day keeps a doctor away. Is that true? <laughs> Is that why you have a basket of apples there? Because you don't want me back. Nah, Titus. Yeah. And I think doctors will be very angry because doctors want to see patients almost every day. Yeah. So you talked about being uh, at the United Nations, of course. Um, so you are understandably the first and uh, the first woman and African to be in that position as the UN Special Rapporteur. Mm -hmm. uh, talk us through this uh, milestone. 
Yes. So my mandate is on the right to health and the full title is very long, but I'm going to give yeah. it to you anyway. Okay, sure. uh, it's the United Nations Special Repertoire on the Right of Everyone to mm. the Highest Attainable Standard wow. Of physical and mental health. Halala. That's the entire title. <laughs> yeah. So we always just say oh, UN yeah, Special yeah, Repertoire yeah. on Health, on health. right? Yeah, to just yeah, make yeah, it yeah. short. Um, oh, right. But that that that's the full title of it. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that title is so important because it talks about the highest attainable standard. Mm-hmm. It includes health. Mm-hmm. It includes mental health and physical health, which is also very important. Mm-hmm. And that journey for me to becoming the UN Special Rapporteur happened because I had been in Geneva as I had been as an activist, um, you know, an independent doctor, um, being interested in human rights and activism. I had been to Geneva many times okay. before and that one year where I was there mm-hmm. and I was meeting with my colleagues in civil society and, you know, they got a pop-up on email that there's new openings for independent experts mm-hmm. and people can be nominated and and or apply themselves. And mm-hmm. so I decided to apply okay. and I didn't have any intentions or any dreams of being there. I thought, well, firstly, I can go through a UN interview and, mm-hmm. and, and feel how rigorous that is. It will help me in terms of, you know, preparing and, and rereading and working my CV. Mm-hmm. I'm dating my CV. <laughs> yeah. um, but I also was very honest, you mm-hmm. know, um, that I... I bring that lived reality of being a child apartheid survivor to my work. Yeah. I know that as an adult black mm-hmm. woman who comes from South Africa, that the apartheid system itself had particular things they had embedded in policy and practice in mm-hmm. medicine that mm-hmm. were racist and colonial and holding us back from our true uh, uh, realization of health. Yeah. And I was very honest too that I will take on that role yeah. in very anti-colonial, anti-racist frameworks, mm-hmm. but also in my proposals of what the future can be, use substantive equality, which means we need to understand how power shifts and moves through people. But we also need to be committed ultimately to a life of dignity, not just an equality of yeah. opportunity or outcomes, but that people live lives of dignity. So that was my truth to them. And they still appointed me. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, that's fine. Then we wow. can work on this because that's my vision and that's what I will do. And that's what I've dedicated my entire tenure at the United Nations mm-hmm. as their independent expert on health, centering people who have been marginalized, mm-hmm. understanding the root causes of illness and ill health but also understanding what it will take for all of us to thrive um, yeah. and truly, truly be free. Yeah, very proud of you. And you're talking about, uh, of course, the role that you're playing at the UN. I understand that the UN now has invoked uh, Article 99 um, uh, of the United uh, Charter, uh, given the situation in Israel, the Israel-Palestine uh, uh, conflict. Uh what do you understand that to be? What can we expect uh, from that, uh, you know, uh, um, that step from the United mm-hmm. Nations? Look, one thing about this um, crisis that mm-hmm. has um, escalated on the 7th of October, mm-hmm. we need to remember the context um, that that is an escalation within an already existing war on Palestinian people. Yes. And that Palestinians and especially the people in the occupied Palestinian territory mm-hmm. had been living in what is the biggest open air prison in the world. Oh, yes. There are people in that area right now who are 20, 21, 22, who've never not known to be in that prison. Mm-hmm. Right. And so people have always um, been determined to get their freedom yeah. Um, to end the occupation. Yes. And we need to understand it within our own context as South Africans, right? Mm-hmm. For our struggle for apartheid, through apartheid, um, our struggle for freedom, that it did come at a cost. Um, okay. And that our own commitment to freedom as black South Africans mm-hmm. far exceeded any fear we had of the moment. Mm-hmm. The promise of a free future that insatiable appetite, you cannot extinguish the human desire to be free. Mm -hmm. And that surpassed any other feeling, whether it's fear or worry or concern for the moment. Mm -hmm. And why institutions such as the United Nations are important is that they must worry about the moment. Mm -hmm. They must worry about the conditions of war. They must worry about the fact that this escalation has happened on a chronic situation. So we've already let people of Palestine down. We already let people of Gaza down. Mm. It's how we respond in this acute phase of an escalation. 
yes. that will set the tone for what's possible in the future. So the multilateral system itself has received one of its biggest tests yet, I would even argue. Mm -hmm. And it's the dehumanization of people who are racialized in particular ways, who have particular religions, who are of particular ethnicities mm -hmm. that has allowed world leaders to sit by and fold their arms and just release press statements. And my criticism has always been that world leaders have more in their arsenal, using the terminology of war, yeah. than just writing press releases. Sure. If world leaders demanded that ceasefire, they must go to the Gaza Strip mm -hmm. and get that ceasefire. Mm -hmm. Another press release from Geneva or New York is not what the people of Gaza need right now. So on the one hand, I'm pleased that almost, well, beyond two months later now, mm -hmm. that this, this letter of the Secretary General has gone out to the Security Council, mm -hmm. but there is a lot more that we need to be doing. And, and just assessing this issue from a humanitarian lens only is going again to let people of Palestine down. Mm -hmm. It's not that we want a humanitarian pause of a ceasefire yeah. so people can have food and water so they can be killed two hours later, but at least their stomachs will be full, mm -hmm. right? No, we want a complete ceasefire and an end to the occupation and to allow Palestinians to self-determine their own future and co-create their own future yeah. without colonization and white imperialism. Yeah. And the EFF uh, leadership uh, on Wednesday, they met with the leadership of uh, Hamas uh, here at Winima Digzela Mandela House in efforts to try and as understand what could be the best uh, intervention to, you know, put the war to an end. And uh, the EFF, as you would know, it marched to the... As um, the Israeli embassy in Pretoria to demand uh, that that embassy must be closed. Ultimately, it was closed. Do you expect world leaders to unite in robust action like the EFF is currently doing, like the UN is currently doing? What more action do we need to ultimately put the fight in or the conflict in Israel to, to, to rest? I think it's important to also realize that one of the um, available avenues, like mm -hmm. the Security Council, yes. right, the permanent five member states mm -hmm. um, can veto any vote mm -hmm. that they do not support or align with. Mm -hmm. And for as long as the Security Council itself is not reformed in terms of equity mm -hmm. and power and authority to effect necessary change, mm -hmm everyone else around will be screaming and coming up with great ideas mm -hmm. for them to be vetoed in the Security Council because that's how the multilateral system works, right? Yeah. The, the, the member states who are represented and representing particular governments, some of them have more power than others within the UN itself. Mm -hmm. And if you think historically, a lot of the global South, including South Africa um, countries, have been saying we need to reform the Security Council because it feels like on the one hand... Yes. Um, you know, they're able to act and name the atrocities very well mm -hmm. and come up with effective, immediate solutions when certain people are affected. But on the other hand, when war and conflict affects certain mm -hmm. people in certain areas, there's a certain lethargy to it. There is um, a sense that people are deliberately misunderstanding the context. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, it does speak to a larger problem that we have in the multilateral system yeah. to say, are they all fit for purpose, mm -hmm. right? We had the same conversation with COVID. Is the WHO fit for, for, for purpose? We had the same discussions with the financial mm -hmm. um, uh, crisis and, and even now when people yeah. are talking about climate crisis and, and climate financing. Mm -hmm. Are all these financial, global, international institutions fit for purpose? So I don't think any of us should feel shy to mm -hmm. say, actually, we are now in 2023 and the issues that are affecting 2023 are not the same issues of when the charter was made or when the yeah. permanent five member states mm -hmm. um, were voted and decided that they would be the five and everyone else would be rotating. Mm -hmm. Are those still working for us? Are they still working for us? Is that configuration working for us? And I think that's the conversation that world leaders everywhere, in corporate, in governance, in, 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 in um, you know, uh, human rights, everywhere yeah. are not wanting to have yeah. to say, are the tools that we have still good enough for the kinds of challenges that we have? Mm -hmm. And they're not about individual personalities of who is the person leading. These are fundamental questions mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. sustainability, survival, but also 
be doing right by people. Mm -hmm. Doing right by people. When people say we feel left out, we feel forgotten. That must mean something to mm. world leaders, especially when your slogan is leave no one behind. Yes. And you have more than 2 million people in that tiny, tiny strip mm. saying we are forgotten. Mm -hmm. You are leaving us behind. Yeah. That surely must mean something more than just another press conference or another press release. Yeah. And looking at the humanitarian crisis in uh, Gaza, uh, hospitals have been, uh, uh, you know, bombed. The kids have been killed. Uh, this must be very concerning. It is, and of course, in my role as the UN Special Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, um, mm -hmm. through the UN, there are confidential um, communications that we send to states, any state mm -hmm. around the world who's a member state of the UN, where we highlight to them any potential or current or ongoing human rights violations. Mm -hmm. And we allow them the chance to then send back communication to me based on some of the questions of clarification that I have sent. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully when they give me those answers, they can then be, um, uh, um, you know, understood, framed to better understand the situation. That takes time. Mm -hmm. What we know right now is that we have lost a lot of healthcare workers, doctors, paramedics, surgeons, admin staff. We've also lost United Nations staff who were working at the humanitarian um, camps, who were working at the UN schools, who were offering social services in Gaza itself. And so when you look at just the amount of skill and support and human resources lost in Gaza, mm -hmm. the people are even worse off. Because even if you are alive, yes. you can't access some of the services simply because the people who were giving you that services mm -hmm. were themselves mm -hmm. murdered, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have our colleagues who are currently um, experienced uh, enforced disappearance. We don't know where some of the doctors were, um, uh, you know, who were, who were part of a convoy and then suddenly they, they, they went missing. The other important element, though, is yeah. that, of course, I do and I have released public statements on this issue mm -hmm. that the healthcare system... Um, should not be part of targets of war. Um, there are clear, clear conventions that protect mm -hmm. um, civilians, but also that protect health infrastructure as well as healthcare workers themselves. Mm -hmm. And in many instances, we know that those have not been adhered to. And my worry now is that in the occupied Palestinian territory, the kind of destruction that has happened will take some of the biggest summoning of leadership and power and resourcing than any other crisis I think we've seen in our lives. We are witnessing mm -hmm. in real time a very devastating, abhorrent, incalcitrant violence yeah. at the hands of white supremacists and colonialists. And uh, I think you are, you are seeing a mouthful because in the context of apartheid, in South Africa, when, when South Africa was under apartheid, it was the international community that stood in solidarity with us uh, through sanctions and all. Do you think the role that the, 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 the South African government is playing in sort of mediation or intervention is sufficient to ensure that there is ceasefire uh, between Israel and Palestinian people? So I think also just even in that, right, mm -hmm. um, there is an um, equivalency um, that people like to make as if... Mm -hmm. Israel fighting in Palestine, that's a that's a war of equals. Mm -hmm. Those are not the war of equals, mm -hmm. right? You have a nuclear power mm -hmm. that is getting arms and ammunition. Oh, yes. Supported by other the rich US. countries. Yeah, the US. Right? Versus an occupied people mm -hmm. oh, yeah. who've been under occupation oh, for decades, mm -hmm. right? Who are showing a form of resistance to that colonization, oh, yes. to that occupation. Yes. So even the way that people understand the resistance of Palestinians to being colonized, mm -hmm. for us as South Africans, it's a very real lived experience, mm -hmm. right? Mandela remained on the terror list yes. five years before he died. Mm -hmm. Mandela, he remained on the terror list. Mm -hmm. And yet, by the same governments, the same United Nations, he's made a symbol of peace and transition and statesmen and leadership in the world. Yes. But he remained on the terror list mm -hmm. all of five years before he died. That is just to show you the hypocrisy of the world. Mm. And so 
South Africa as a state, as a government, have been very clear and they are on the right side mm-hmm. of history. But also, I was a teenager when Nelson Mandela, but more so Umama Wini, was teaching us that our freedom is tied to the freedom of Palestinians. We are not free until the Palestinians are free. Mm-hmm. One of the very first places that Nelson Mandela went to as a state president of this country, South Africa, was to go to Gaza. Mm-hmm. Was to go to Gaza. Mm-hmm. And he was very clear in that statement what it means to be a movement that's resisting your land to be dispossessed, what mm-hmm. it means to be a movement that's resisting colonization and imperialism, that we will speak and we will speak and we will speak. There will be a moment, though, when those words no longer mean anything. Mm-hmm. That was Nelson Mandela in Gaza. Mm-hmm. And so we have to be careful as South Africans how the rest of the world sanitizes our own history, mm-hmm. but sanitizes our own symbols of freedom and of, of, of apartheid. Mm-hmm. Because what Nelson Mandela stood for, for me it's ironic yeah. that the UN decided that the year 2019 to 2028 is the decade of peace. Nelson mm-hmm. Mandela decade of peace. Mm-hmm. And there's a quote where Nelson Mandela says, you can't get peace without looking at the root causes. Everyone wants peace, but no one is willing to look at root causes. Mm -hmm. So South Africa as a member state of the UN has been playing that role of saying, no, no, no. Peace is one thing, Mm -hmm. but how can you get peace in the context of occupation? Yeah. How can you get peace in that context of dispossession? uh, Allies of Israel who are supporting them with, uh, you know, uh, arsenal and other weapons to continue with the war. Remember South Africa let go of their nuclear powers when Mandela became president Mm -hmm. as part of our commitment Mm -hmm. to the world, to the agenda of sustainable peace, Mm -hmm. to a world that no longer has conflict and war. South Africa did that. We let go of our nuclear uh, arms So we are no longer a nuclear power per se, right? Mm -hmm. But going through that experience of apartheid, we know what happened with Mkontoisis when the underground uh, militant militant groups. Mm -hmm. We know those people were South African. They were of us. Mm -hmm. So when then we get to a situation where Palestinians are resisting the very thing that us as South Africans were resisting, Mm -hmm. how can we not understand what that is? So by all indications, we can't reduce the Hamas to a terrorist uh, movement because it's they are simply resisting the occupation of their land. And as an occupying power, mm-hmm. Israel can't claim self-defense. Mm-hmm. But of course, the mainstream media yeah, has allowed that, that, that narrative. narrative and that yeah. thing to go. There are rules to everything. Mm-hmm. But to the extent to which others are held accountable to those rules, it's very different. Mm-hmm. Israel right now is an occupying power in Palestine, cannot claim self-defense on an occupied people. Yes. The other thing is, as an example, during COVID, because, you know, it's not the first time that we are dealing with the issue of occupied Palestinian territory. Mm -hmm. Part of the interventions that I had made at the time with a colleague of mine at the UN Uh was to remind Israel as an occupying power, the responsibilities they had to make sure that Palestinians have water have food, have electricity, even under lockdown uh, conditions during the pandemic, and that they have access to vaccinations. Mm-hmm. It is part of their... If you are going to occupy someone and hold them in an open-air prison, mm-hmm. you do have responsibilities. True. And so even the way that food and water in this current context after the 7th of October has been used as a weapon of war, mm-hmm. starving people, dehydrating people, right, to try push them closer to the edge. Well, Palestinians have been at the edge. Mm-hmm. They have been at the edge. The agricultural farmlands mm-hmm. are routinely destroyed by settlers in their area. Mm-hmm. Their water resources for the agricultural lands are always destroyed. They are always not having consistent electricity. They are always having to carry identity documents yeah. to prove yeah. who they are and their spaces where they can go. Even in that sea, mm-hmm. they can only go up to a certain distance into the sea even the sea is colonized in palestine Mm -hmm. so there is no way that we can have just a we will eradicate hamas and then we will win it's an eradication of a people Mm -hmm. what's happening is an eradication of a people right now and we are watching Mm -hmm. it in real time yeah and i think hamas should uh, continue defending their own land and uh, the eff as well is throwing its weight behind the hamas 
and they've already the EFF has already called on a boycott. Do you think a boycott is another measure to sort of contribute towards uh, the end of the humanitarian crisis? So the boycott, divestment, and the mm-hmm. sanctions movement. Mm-hmm. Again, we're gonna keep saying this, but as South Africans, we know. Mm-hmm. What happened? It's not like F.W. Dittler yeah. and Bota and all of them suddenly thought, oh, we are so nice and look at these poor black people. Sure. Let's give them equality and rights like us. Mm-hmm. Those people's hands were forced. They were not nice men who suddenly woke up and thought, ah, we yes, are all equal. Sure. So, yes, there is benefit to the divesting, the boycotting and the sanctions. Mm-hmm. And we know the world in terms of multilateral uh, systems in terms of world leaders and systems in the world, they are capable mm-hmm. of doing that mm-hmm. when they think the people affected are worthy. Mm-hmm. The problem now yeah. is we sit with a situation where the Palestinians, because of the way they are racialized, because of their ethnicity, because of the land where they are, are not seen as worthy, mm-hmm. which is why two months later, mm-hmm. two months later, mm-hmm. There hasn't been any communication or any speaking of actual mm-hmm. states taking on um, and actually divesting or, or, or proposing sections yeah. in the way that you saw with Ukraine and Russia. Yeah. Right. So there is a hypocrisy there that we can't deny. And for me, for as long as we can't be honest in what we have failed in, mm-hmm. we can't move forward with a proper solution mm-hmm. because it means we are even in we are lying even Mm -hmm. in the moment of the disaster of what is required, Mm -hmm. right? We are being, we need to be honest. This has failed, but why did it fail? There's other wars in in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. There's other wars in Africa. Mm -hmm. Haiti, Somalia, South Mm -hmm. Sudan, Mm -hmm. Ethiopia. There's many crises happening around the world. Mm -hmm. Why was this one the one that got everyone at a standstill. So we can't lie that there's no context to this. There yeah. is a context to it. Sure. And uh, I think uh, the solution, obviously, is to have Palestine, the Palestinian people having their own land. And indeed, uh, Palestine will be free uh, from the river to the sea. Now, let's come back home. As a medical doctor, are you happy with the state of health care in the province? I mean, in the in the in the country, mm. I beg your pardon. So, in the in South Africa, the state of health, from your perspective as a medical doctor, do you think um, it's fine? Are there areas there that needs to change? What What's <laughs> your take? Yeah, as a as a medical doctor, uh-huh. I am not filled with excitement when mm-hmm. I think about the health system. Yeah. And I'm deliberately not differentiating between public or private. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about the health system in its entirety. As a patient in South Africa, I know that my colleagues are some of the best mm-hmm. doctors, physicians, nurses yeah. in the world. And I've been to a lot of places. So you can trust me on that one. Mm-hmm. As a human rights activist and someone who advocates for human rights, I do not sleep well. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of um, obstacles that are standing between us as citizens, as rights holders, Mm -hmm. from realizing our right to physical and mental health, the highest attainable standard. So it's not just access to a health clinic. It's the highest attainable standard. Mm -hmm. And if that is our marker of success, Mm -hmm. we would then see that we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. I think there's a lot of practices in the health system that were not interrogated and they became part of the health system, but they were very colonial and very much racist Mm -hmm. and very much uh, of the agenda of the apartheid government, right? Just if you think about how blackness is treated, how poverty is treated. Mm -hmm. um, And and my my hope Mm -hmm. is that we understand the health system itself as a social system. Okay. Right. Because there's a lot that happens within the health system. You know, mm-hmm. I say to my colleagues, when you write a prescription for someone and you say, take this antibiotics three times a day with food. Okay. 
How many assumptions have you made just by writing that one prescription? Mm. You've made assumptions that the yeah. person can afford the prescription in the first place. Mm. You've made the assumption that every time that person has to take a tablet, there's be. food. Yeah. Right? Mm. And those show you that we are not awake to what the reality of the people are in South Africa. And so as a health system that just sees itself as exceptional, scientific, oh, yeah. and just about the power of doctors and nurses, mm -hmm. and not sees itself as a social system where people need to thrive, where wellness needs to happen, right? Where systems need to change to support anyone who walks in through the door mm -hmm. with any kind of problem, mm -hmm. yeah? So we need a much more networked, health system okay. to other social systems. So nurses and doctors, for example, I wrote a report for the UN on food mm -hmm. and the right to health. And one of my recommendations there is that nurses and doctors need to be taught how to assess people for food insecurity. Mm -hmm. We live in a country where food insecurity is a big thing. It is. So you can't be going to the clinic every mm -hmm. other month mm -hmm. and no one ever assesses for your food security. But you know we have, you have chronic anemia, maybe you are menstruating and you have abnormal menstruation, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you have other uh, chronic illnesses, viral illnesses that cause you to not have good nutrient absorption. Maybe mm -hmm. you have gut problems, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of reasons why people have micronutrient and macronutrient deficiencies. Mm -hmm. But if we just blame them for those health outcomes, we are not seeing how as a health system, we can be a social system that also responds to people holistically beyond just putting a bandage over a wound or saying here's a... Uh, a paracetamol for yeah. a headache. We need to think of a health system in much more broader ways than just scientific, medicalized, yeah. and biomedical. So a lot needs to happen, basically. A lot needs to happen. And that would be a different podcast altogether. But yeah, sure. absolutely, yeah. um, we, we have... I mean, if you look at our national policies, mm -hmm. they need to be supported by sustainable financing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our programs in health, especially around sexual and productive health, are still depending on donor money. Yeah for them to operate. If particular countries stop donating money, the programs would not exist. So sure. we need to get to a point where the government is able to, on their own, sustain key health programs without depending so much on donor aid and funding. So that's just mm. one example mm -hmm. um, of something, you know. Mm. Uh, and I think in essence, that boils down to building uh, state and government capacity. Absolutely. So now let's look at the... Uh, survey that was uh, released by the Human uh, Sciences Research Council on HIV and AIDS uh, uh, prevalence in mm -hmm. South Africa. So now, according to the, the stats, uh, the prevalence of HIV has declined from 14% in 2017 to now 12% in 2022. What's your take on that? Look, I think any, any trend that shows that we are having less people mm -hmm. infected is a good trend. Mm -hmm. And the question is what made us get there and how do we sustain that? Mm -hmm. We also shouldn't forget um, that there were children in South Africa who were born with HIV, oh, yeah. who are themselves um, suffering with a stigma that HIV is only a sexually transmitted infection. So there are young people, there are teenagers now who have an extra burden, an extra layer of obstacles in how to test, how to get counseling, how to disclose their status to their uh, uh, um, to their peers, to their family, mm -hmm. because we think HIV is linked just to having sex. So, but a lot of children were born. Remember, this country let a lot of people down, but oh. it, especially its children Through down the mother to, to child, child transmission, transmission right? Oh, yeah. And all of those delays that happened, and it ended oh, up yeah. being a, a court case that had to, you know, force the hand of the government mm -hmm. to do comprehensive um, response to this. Mm -hmm. Despite many amazing researchers and doctors on the mm -hmm. ground doing the right thing, you know, it wasn't even easy for them mm -hmm. um, to advocate. Yeah. But that's just one example of the, the, the how, how far we've come with that story. And I think those statistics are very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And we need to really also, on top of that, keep in mind that a lot of people are raped in South Africa mm -hmm. and they do not receive post-rape support in terms of oh. HIV prevention and so how many of those stats are actually from those kinds of um, mm -hmm. contexts and situations. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really good that we see that there is a, a national decline. decline. If you look and you dissect the data, 
I would be interested to know what's happening with 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 children mm-hmm. who are between the ages of 12 and 18, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Especially when we understand mm-hmm. um, that the rape of children in South Africa is is underreported. Yeah. And when it's reported, it's called teen pregnancy, which is a big problem, yeah. right? Because you are only then talking about girls with an ability to get pregnant mm-hmm. and who got pregnant from a rape. There are many other girls who don't get pregnant from a rape. How are we going to reach them? There are boy children who are raped and mm-hmm. do not get pregnant from a rape. What are we saying to them and how are we getting yeah. to them? So the HIV statistics are great, but it, it, it opens up another layer of discussion and, and requires analysis of who then is contributing to those statistics. But yeah. overall, yeah, we're not doing too bad. Now, I'm very glad that uh, I'm talking to a medical doctor, not just a, a general person. And I'm going to tap into this now. I want us to understand. I want you to help us understand. When you go and test for HIV, right? Uh, when you test positive, what is the first step that you need to take? Do you go and get the antiretroviral pills or therapy? Or you go through clinical examination? Because you would remember the mm. former president, uh, Tabo Mbeki, argues and still argues that HIV does not cause AIDS. HIV, in fact, once you get tested for HIV and it the, the test is positive, that does not mean you have HIV. It only means that your body is, re, uh, uh, you know, uh, responding or rejecting, right? So I want you to demystify this and help us understand from a medical point of view, what is the first step of after testing? What do you do after testing? And what are the implications of HIV? Does it cause AIDS? Please help us understand that. Yeah, so HIV is called him. Hem- human immunodeficiency virus. Yes. And so we all just call it HIV for short. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it, because it's a virus, mm-hmm. um, there's no cure, right? Like okay, many sure. viruses, like sure. the influenza virus, we get flu with seasonal changes. Mm-hmm. And we all say, oh, it's that time again, the season is changing, right? Because we know we get flu and we know the symptoms. Mm-hmm. And so HIV, like other viruses, um, yeah. there's no cure. You manage the condition oh, okay. depending on which part of your system of your body it's affecting, mm-hmm. right? And... Our former, former president is an economist. Okay. I'm a medical doctor. All right. I don't talk about economists and I don't talk about the exchange rates. I don't talk about <laughs> fiscal policies because what are you I don't know them. Hey, he must stay on his lane. He must stay saying? in his lane. <laughs> um, and we've come a long way. You know, it's been 2023. I think it's, it's an unfortunate part of our history that that happened. And I think it's an example of what happens when politicians overtake the work of clinicians and researchers and people whose job is to do the scientific work. Mm -hmm. And a lot of amazing work was being done in South Africa and continues to be done in South Africa. And at the time, it was done in spite Mm -hmm. of the politicians. It was done in spite of the politicians standing in the way of good science and good clinical management. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a lot of research. There's been a lot of data. There's been a lot of improvements in terms of the kinds of combinations of medications that are available. People are living and thriving. People are celebrating living for 20, 25 years Mm -hmm. in South Africa, Mm -hmm. right? And so we need to remember that. Mm -hmm. And many people did die because of that denialism of HIV Mm -hmm. and We don't talk about it enough when we talk about, or at least when we reflect on that presidency and what it cost in terms of people's lives. Even the life expectancy, I remember. Even life expectancy, exactly. Um, But if you want to get cheeky, you can say, well, that's the same guy who decided to not maintain ESCOM and not make a plan for our future energy requirements for this country. And he was an economist. So I'm Mm -hmm. not going to, right? I think you you hear what I'm saying. As a medical doctor... Mm -hmm. There are protocols that we have designed previously that we have updated. And I know through many UN agencies, but also many uh, civil society-led organizations, Mm -hmm. we've done what we call people-centered approach. Mm -hmm. A people-centered approach means when you come to the clinic Mm -hmm. and you say, look, I think I may have a STI or have a discharge or I'm not sure of this or my urine is burning. Mm -hmm. We are not going to immediately say to you, if you don't test for HIV, we're not going to help you at all. Mm -hmm. That used to happen. Now we are going to give you counseling and say, 
The symptoms you have may be a bacterial sexually transmitted infection. Mm -hmm. There is treatment for that bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. Once you have one STI, we know that you may very well have another, right? Mm -hmm. And then there are others. There's gonorrhea, there's syphilis, there's many others, yes. herpes. And we will then have a conversation with you about HIV as well and give you information about HIV. How do you get HIV? How do you know you have HIV? Mm -hmm. And now the only way to really know mm -hmm. is through a test. All right. And by the time you do the test and it comes back positive, mm -hmm. you should have had that conversation with a health worker, maybe once or twice even, mm -hmm. so that when it comes back and it's positive, mm -hmm. that's not the first time you are thinking, oh my gosh, yeah. what am I going to do? Because even I ask my patients, mm -hmm. if it comes back positive, do you have someone that you know you can tell or do you not have support or do you feel mm -hmm. that in your life you just do not have anyone that you can trust mm -hmm. with that level of your medical you know, information? Yes. Some people will tell you that I'm married and I'm, I would be shocked if I get it because yeah. I'm only having sex with my husband. So there are so many different reasons why people are not even going to immediately be able to disclose. But for their own treatment options, absolutely. Now we have test and treat where... We don't wait for your CD4 count to go all the way down to 200, then it was 350, then for different patient categories, it's different mm -hmm. numbers. We are now saying, research has shown us, let's support your body remain well and healthy mm -hmm. by decreasing the viral load. And the only way to decrease the viral load, because remember HIV, it makes new copies of itself every day. Mm -hmm. That's why it overwhelms your whole body. Mm -hmm. The only way to stop the HIV from replicating and overwhelming your own immune system okay. is to take the anti retroviral treatment okay. that stops a replication now when replication stops it means there'll be less and less and less hiv copies circulating in your blood that will then affect you your brain your lungs your liver your kidneys your skin all yeah. of those so once the test is positive you must start the treatment you if you, you want to start the treatment you can Remember, okay. the treatment itself is through consent. The same way we ask sure. you to consent for sure. the test, mm -hmm. you will be asked and taken through the steps. And we hope that with good counseling, with good understanding, mm -hmm. you will most likely start the treatment. But from a clinical point of view, once the test is positive, you are positive. Yes, you are. Okay. Yes, you are. And remember, sometimes people do these... Um, uh, work work events mm -hmm. and they'll just do a finger prick mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and often the, the recommendation is if you do a screening test mm -hmm. go and confirm it with a laboratory test right. but in some contexts there are there's no capacity for those sophisticated laboratory tests mm -hmm. and so we we you know clinical and and those screening if it's positive i think treat yourself mm -hmm. <laughs> that you are Go to your doctor, go to your nurse, get them to do a confirmatory um, test, let them do counseling with you, explain what all of that means. And therefore, you will know how to firstly get healthy and well yourself, mm -hmm. but also how to protect your partners as well, because you can live and have a fulfilling sexual life mm -hmm. and still be HIV positive. So it is scientifically proven that HIV can cause AIDS. It does cause AIDS. It does cause AIDS. Yes. So... Former President Tawumbeki, obviously you said he must stay on his lane. You said something about energy crisis. Do you think it's part of the problem? We could have done something to avert yeah, I the think, load shedding that we're currently experiencing? I think we, we need to, as South Africans, you mm -hmm. know, we have a, I don't know what it is, but we have a very <laughs> short memory okay. and, a, and, a, and a very <laughs> endearing sense of nostalgia, right? All right. Uh, and and sometimes <laughs> we think our problems started yeah. today. I like, you know, we feel them today. So mm -hmm. they, you may feel like load shedding is happening today. So the problem started today. But if you read and you go back into records and, mm -hmm. and archives, you will see the, pre the decisions that President Mandela made. Mm -hmm. You can see and analyze the different decisions that uh, uh, President Mbeki made. Mm -hmm. You can see the different decisions that Zuma made. And we can analyze for ourselves. And I think we don't have enough public discourse mm -hmm. into that sure. depth of Agreed. actual reading, Agreed. but also yeah. analyzing yeah. what has happened. Because, you know, and, and as, as an economist, Mbeki was very clear about fiscal policy this. And mm -hmm. he appointed, you know, his cabinet was sure. was beefed up, right? Like mm -hmm. with all of the people that he had. Mm -hmm. And and so all I'm saying is let's go back to the archives <laughs> and see who should have spent more time making sure that we have energy today in South Africa, that we invested in infrastructure. Yeah. And he had the mandate to do it as an economist mm -hmm. um, and see where we are as doctors in spite of him. Mm. Wow. 
That's profound. Now, let's look into the policies. When I asked you about the state of, uh, or rather the healthcare system in South Africa, you talked about the policies. On Wednesday, uh, the NCOP uh, voted in favor of the NHI bill. Mm. Let's dip into that. Is the NHI bill, bill, or now that is going to be signed into law, is it something that we need to celebrate, uh, Look, particularly looking at the equitable health care? Uh, in South Africa, you know, there's a gap between the rich and the poor. What a sad moment. Is it? I mean, I think it's, it's the most single worrying moment um and it will define healthcare in this country for for decades and generations to come and not in a good way you know before we got where we got to in terms of the signing um that happened well at least the affirmation that happened in the ncop yeah there were pilots that were done where certain sub districts in the country were run as if we were in an nhi Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. And those pilots failed dismally, some of them being in Putadichab, dismally. Mm. They failed already before Cyril Ramaphosa's presidency. Those Mm -hmm. pilots were happening when Mutsualedi was still uh, very much pushing on the NHI. And Mm -hmm. there was a pilot that was done. Mm -hmm. So my only question is, based on those pilots, based on the results of the pilots, Mm -hmm. based on the recommendation that came out of those pilot studies, because it was was many sites. It wasn't Mm -hmm. like one or two sites. Mm -hmm. What have they done to prepare us for the NHI implementation Mm -hmm. now that is now law? Because remember then, we had the flexibility of learning. We had the flexibility of rethinking about financing and resourcing. Mm -hmm. We had an opportunity through those pilots to think about human resourcing, to think about digitization. Mm -hmm. We had an opportunity to to think about a lot of things in healthcare, Mm -hmm. medicines. How do we get uh, 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 imaging and sophisticated uh, surgery, right, Mm -hmm. to to communities? Yes. The question is, who is holding the leaders accountable for the fact that they did pilot projects of NHI. It proved what we know as South Africans right now. Hmm. That you cannot change a system on an administrative level and how you build patients and then think that's going to give you health outcomes. The NHI is not supported by doctors. Many are. But the ones that I'm talking about in terms of our medical association, we are not supporting the NHI. If you have the people the core workers Mm -hmm. who are the backbone of your national health insurance, not supporting it, yet they work in such dire situations every day. Mm -hmm. And yet whatever promise of a future you give them, they're like, no, that's not, that's not going to work. And we don't support it. Surely that must make you stop and think a little bit. Mm -hmm. What makes doctors or the, those within the health sector, uh, sort of uh, push back against this uh, bill. Is it because now there won't be medical aids? Uh, because I understand part of the bill is that there won't be uh, medical aids anymore. What is it that you are more concerned about about the, on the bill? Nothing new. Mm-hmm. And that's what's unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Doctors and nurses are always saying we don't, there aren't enough of us in the system. Mm-hmm. So the posts are frozen. Where there are posts, they are not being filled Mm -hmm. because that money is being repurposed elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Doctors and nurses are saying we don't have enough equipment for all the patients and all the needs that they have. Mm -hmm. We have problems with procurement and maladministration and corruption in the health sector as it is. Mm -hmm. We don't have electronic patient systems where we can have some... uh, um, uh, pattern or predictability or at least have where we can draw a patient's uh, records Mm -hmm. and see how they've been doing over the year. Every time you go to a clinic, it's like it's the first time. Sometimes they'll even give you a little step as an over over paper, just (laughs) just for today, you know? And you never know where that piece of paper lands. Doctors and nurses are exhausted Mm -hmm. because all of the system and structural failures in the health system 
have always been borne by them as individuals in the system. Mm -hmm. When you go to the clinic now and the queue is going around the block, you say the nurses and doctors here are lazy. Mm. You don't say, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. <laughs> the doctor still hasn't arrived because they were on call at the district hospital for the last 24 hours. Instead of going home, mm -hmm. he just maybe needs to grab something to drink and she can then drive to the clinic and start the day at the clinic and see all of the patients mm -hmm. for that day in the clinic. Mm. So that doctor, she would have been up now 30 plus hours. Mm -hmm. Is that the doctor you want to trust with your life? No. Nope. But we don't have a choice. We show up anyway. We are the oath takers. Mm. We took the oath. Yeah. We show up anyway. But even we know that how we show up is not conducive. It's not quality care to patients. Now, if you are going to add another level of an administrative layer, a billings layer, you are not investing in infrastructure at all. Sure. You are not solving sure. these problems that we already know exist. Patients are not eating when they're admitted. Mm. A lot of the times their family must bring them food. The food mm. that's being served is not nutritious in terms of its mm. value. The linen is dirty. Mm. It's unfortunate that maybe, you know, I'm me, but I, I get photos of linen that has growing mold on it because it hasn't that been washed. That time you're in a healthcare facility. You are in a, so how is the healthcare itself ill and fragile and fractured? Mm. That same system won't miraculously become a place of healing and wellness yeah. and thriving and dignity because you've passed a bill that addresses not even the problems that mm. are currently existing where they haven't shown through some of those pilots that indeed... We have a problem because that's what a pilot does. It tells you what the problem is. So I don't have a problem that the results were as bad as they were. We just knew so they would be. Do you feel like the, 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 the recommendations or the outcomes of the pilots were somehow ignored? Yes. And we haven't been shown, mm -hmm. right, as the people who are important for the sector, who are important for the success of the NHI. Mm -hmm. We were not shown where we lie in that whole chain. Oh. Yeah. We were not consultant to say, practically speaking, when you run a medical practice, mm -hmm. this is what it means, right? Remember many of us, people say, oh, doctors are both in private and public. Yes, because if I decided to stay in my private practice, there'd be no specialists in sure. the public health care, right? So mm -hmm. we are in a place where we are blaming doctors and nurses for systemic and structural problems. Mm -hmm. And those problems are not going to be fixed by the NHI, which, where's the budget coming from? Where is the budget for the NSP for gender-based violence? Mm. It's now 2023. Women marched. They marched to the union buildings. How many years ago? Mm. That structure has no governance. That structure has no funding. So we are just repeating the same mistakes with different bills, with different ideas. And, and for me, it's unfortunate because universal health coverage is something that I advocate for. Yes. But a national health insurance is a very technical thing that if it doesn't work, it's going to impede even more access to people. It won't automatically lead to universal health coverage. And people need to understand that mm -hmm. there's a difference between the ideal of universal health coverage and it coming alive yeah. and just passing an NHI come hello high water yeah. as if that's going to automatically bring equity and universal health coverage. It won't. The administrative yeah. layers sure. that you will need to jump... I mean, you are, you are going to create... A, a new group of black people who are now indebted to the government for health. You're going to sure. have debt collectors because you went to have stitches mm -hmm. in the clinic two months ago. And and also, which clinic? Because I, I, I understand you. I like your analogy, how you unpack this whole thing. Because the people of uh, Boputa Chwana, is it Boputa Di Chaba? Boputa Di Chaba. Boputa Di Chaba, yes. Think of the people of Boputa uh, Di Chaba, Right who have no access to a private hospital. Because if you check some of the clauses in the NHI bill, they dictate that there's a referral system. You should go to your nearest hospital. Meaning if someone lives in Kwakwa, where there is no clinic or state-of-the-art hospital that is in maybe a feedback, they, they can't go to feedback for medical care. It means they have to be subjected to a dilapidated clinic, which, by the way, closes 
before six. So that you, doesn't open even 24 hours. You are not even talking <laughs> about a hypothetical scenario. Yeah. That is happening right now in Putalichava. Mm-hmm. If you need Putalichava, a specialist yeah. in the public sector, mm-hmm. you need to wait sometimes two weeks, sometimes a month, sometimes two months mm-hmm. to be transported from Putalichava in Kwakwa yeah. to three hours away in Bloemfontein. Mm-hmm. When you get to Bloemfontein, they say, ah, thanks for coming. Hey, you see the queue, we are very busy. So we will see you next year. Right now as I speak to you, there are people who now have a next year appointment. They were there two weeks ago. They were given an appointment here next year. That's not hypothetical. There is no drug rehabilitation services in Kwakwa or Putadichab. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the statistics, you will see the statistics for drug use. You will see the statistics for youth unemployment mm-hmm. in Kwakwa. There are no services for post-sexual assault services in Kwakwa. Yet one of our courts in Putadichaba, some of them in Teki, in the villages, mm-hmm. have some of the highest cases of rape mm. in the country. But there's no post-rape support center in Kwakwa. Mm. We are depending on individual women who are themselves possibly survivors through their NGOs setting up some sheltering. few years ago, in fact, it was during COVID, mm-hmm. pregnant women in one of the biggest hospitals in Putadichaba, mm-hmm. had to go queue for the Jojo, for water for themselves, for when they're in the maternity ward, in hospital clothes. Mm-hmm. So in a nutshell, this NHI seeks to benefit the rich because if you stay in Santen where there's, you know, obviously it's an affluent area and someone who lives in Kwakwa, mm. it means there won't be an equitable access to these healthcare services. The promise of the NHI is Mm ill-timed, it's ill-conceived, and it will not yield the desired outcomes. Because even on a managerial level, Mm -hmm. executive managerial level, political level, Mm -hmm. there's no stewardship. There's no true sense of commitment to these are public resources and they need to be used in ways that lead to particular health outcomes Mm -hmm. and that we lead our society to X point. What what is the vision for health in South Africa? What's the vision? Do you know? I don't know. because What's the the vision? Where are we going? It's it's not uh, in the plan because if anything, if, 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 if really the government was serious about addressing the issue of access to uh, healthcare equitably so, First and foremost, they should open clinics 24 hours, 24-7 per week. Now, that's universal health coverage. Yes. Do you see what I'm saying? That doesn't need a bill mm-hmm. that's called NHI mm-hmm. to happen. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so we have been tricked into believing that unless there's an NHI bill on mm-hmm. the table, we can't get all of these things that we want in terms of quality care, accessible care, mm-hmm. acceptable care. Mm-hmm. And that is a lie. You can absolutely get quality, accessible, acceptable care Dignified care, mm-hmm. universal health care. You don't mm-hmm. need that bill. So the, the narrative is that unless we do this, we won't get universal health coverage. There yeah. will still be queues in the clinic. Well, and there'll even be more queues in the clinic because mm-hmm. now I could at least go to one suburb or one location or one village. Mm-hmm. Now you'll be telling me to come with a proof of address for exactly. my cough so I can prove that because I'm in this. Must be registered. To be a beneficiary of NHI. So how is that enabling care? How is that increasing care? How is that universal? So we just use words. Univ- what does universal mean? Yeah, we're being sold a lie here. And I think it's about time people wake up. Look, I've but done... But next year's coming, 2024. <laughs> I've done a lot of... <laughs> I've done a lot of assessments on many yeah. health systems around the world, including European countries, mm-hmm, sure. including Latin American countries, mm-hmm. right? And... I am just as thorough with them Mm -hmm. as I am on this question that you've asked me on NHI. So it's not even a South Africa this way. The Mm -hmm. WHO has a whole section Mm -hmm. on universal health coverage. Mm -hmm. The General Assembly this year, when Mm -hmm. I was participating, they had um, uh, 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 resolutions Mm -hmm. on universal health coverage, pandemic preparedness and tuberculosis. I participated in those, Mm -hmm. right? with trying to suggest different language, trying to infuse human rights and, and in a different oh, yeah. uh, you know way of thinking. So these are not South Africa problems, mm-hmm. but I think our problem in South Africa is that we just push things ahead no matter what. 
we don't allow ourselves the necessary time mm-hmm. to make sure that indeed what we say we are doing mm-hmm. matches what we think we want as outcomes. Mm-hmm. And 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 we need to be to, we need to just change how we 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 think um and how we make policy versus what that policy has in terms of effect um on and always it will be always be disproportionate poor black sure. people will always be disproportionately impacted even those who live in Johannesburg mm-hmm. in the urban centers if you are black and an urban poor you are forgotten oh yes you are forgotten you don't you, you don't get classified anyway because you are urban and then you are homeless and then maybe like me we tell like kwa kwa how na proof of address ya hore your village is even existing on the map yeah and now i'm here looking for a job mm-hmm. so where will i get this universal health you gonna tell me ke kwa ke batle proof of address from the chief <laughs> it's insane then ke khutle and then i give it like no but actually we are not in your designated area who yeah. yeah. that time someone is dying no someone is bleeding they need medical attention and then you are saying you must bring an id or you must bring your proof of <laughs> yeah. address I mean, and then insane. turn those people and, and 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 unleash debt collectors onto them as well mm. unleash debt collectors on them so we are going to create another generation of black people mm-hmm. who now have debt collectors behind them mm. because hapatala bilia ya ya panado flip yeah. i need to change this we need to change this yeah. because if the status quo remains the poor are going to be poorer and the rich are going to be richer there there's been um, a number of trends in south africa about doctors impersonating in fact people uh uh getting people masquerading yes. as doctors they were impersonating doctors uh what was your first impression when you heard about that and uh what causes that and how mm. do we nip it uh, nip it in the bud so of course the national health act is very clear about who mm-hmm. can be a doctor we have the uh our own professional mm-hmm. bodies that give us the license to practice they have their own set of rules and expectations around that mm-hmm. um and clearly you can have someone who went to medical school and did unethical things and they were struck off the roll right mm-hmm. and they have to be dealt with in a very different way you have people who are absolutely pretending to be doctors when they are not doctors even at med school i can't pretend to be a doctor yeah. even if i made med school right even that's still not allowed mm-hmm. um i am an abortion provider so i know that this issue of people fake faking masquerading misleading people into thinking that they are healthcare workers either a nurse or a doctor mm-hmm. is something that south africa cannot seem to want to put mm-hmm. some effort into dealing with um i've i've been to many police stations i've been to many clinics that pretend to be helping women that are fake that some of them the wallpaper is a pay wallpaper of of dogs and cats you know mm-hmm. uh you don't even see the difference between a vet and a, yeah, a, yeah, and, yeah. and a doctor you know so for me it's something that's been there for a long time especially in the area of sexual and reproductive health but specifically around abortion mm-hmm. and i must say that um the recent coverage in the media of different people doing this on social media reminds us how important it is to know how social media works but to also demand mm-hmm. from these social networks to also themselves behave ethically uh from a human rights perspective i get impersonated all the time mm-hmm. on different platforms sure. and it takes a lot for people and for myself to consciously being reporting and saying because i know the harm of this of, of these impersonators mm-hmm. and so it's not even um, a question of uh the impersonator themselves but they mm-hmm. are harming patients they are harming potential mm-hmm. patients and us who then have the ethical duties we spend a lot of time mm-hmm. and energy mm-hmm. trying to constantly report and shut down fake accounts and i think the social media aspect of it is something that we also need to pay attention to as well as the actual physical doctors yeah, in in a clinic yeah. or in a hospital pretending there's a lot as well online yeah. where people are pretending to be giving health um information and it can be very deadly imagine someone um uh, impersonating a doctor and they say they can handle abortion absolutely that can be very deadly how what advice do you have for people who mm. are seeking abortion mm. and you know i wrote about uh, a leaflet on how to try and spot uh, mm. an elite, uh, an unsafe provider oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Often the name, when you search for the name, you won't find it on the HPCSA website. So the Health Professions Council of South Africa, mm -hmm. they don't usually put their, because um, I have a, a, a license number, a practice number that I'm supposed to be having on my prescriptions, oh, on my cards. Okay. If you search for that number, okay. you may not um, get yeah. them. One tip is to phone the pharmacy around where the people are and say, do you know sure. Dr. So-and-so? Sure. The pharmacists normally know all of us because we're oh, phoning each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. They're calling me for certain okay. things. Mm -hmm. I think that's one tip I can give to people. Mm -hmm. But like I said, you know, I looked on one Facebook profile and, and the wallpaper was of, a, of dogs and cats. But if you are not looking, Please. you won't see. Because remember, you and you are pregnant. You don't want to be pregnant. You're not even sure what your rights are. You don't mm -hmm. even know how much money all of this is going to cost you. So you're quite anxious yeah, when you're yeah, doing yeah, this. Yeah. So it's very easy to go with the very first search you find. And unfortunately online, people optimize searches, right? They pay so that their name pops up first. Oh. So Dr. Atalayim will be on page three of your search on Google. Mm -hmm. And yet everything before mm -hmm. is filled with people who are optimizing their search yeah. using money. Um, the other thing, of course, is to 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 search their name on the sure. internet and see what comes up. Um, word of mouth seems to work. I mean, that's how a lot of, uh, we get our patients in the clinic because people just mm -hmm. have to trust other women mm -hmm. and other people that, sure. yes, I know them, I've been there, they helped me or they've helped X mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. um, that works. Because remember, doctors can't advertise. You can't mm -hmm. advertise in South Africa. Sure. Um, and so it's very hard for us as individual doctors to then say, but here's an advert of the real doctor because mm -hmm. we can't, we are not allowed to advertise. But yet, when you walk down the street, mm -hmm. when you walk everywhere, there's full of adverts mm -hmm. of of um, of people who are masquerading as doctors, and nothing happens to them. So I think there's a lack of accountability, yeah. and that lack of consequence is what gets people to keep doing that. Yeah. Uh, because as a as an actual doctor, I can't pull up a billboard. Mm -hmm. But the people who are unsafe, the people who are fake, the people who are masquerading, mm -hmm. the whole of the OBEX CBD mm -hmm. is full of those adverts. So it's hard to make it an individual person to solve. It has to be a system issue. Yeah. Yeah. Do you believe uh, abortion should be a fundamental human right? It's a personal choice. People must have uh, their own choice to decide whether they want to keep or uh, abort mm. in the US for example abortion is illegal well <laughs> <laughs> the answer simply is it is already a right you already yeah. have a right to decide what to happen to your body mm -hmm. you already have a right to decide that I'm pregnant yes I want to be pregnant great mm -hmm. or I'm pregnant no I don't want to be pregnant you have a right to make those choices what the Governments everywhere have a responsibility mm -hmm. to do is make sure that you can get services for whatever your decision is. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't die because of a decision. You sure. shouldn't lose your work because of decision you make. So mm -hmm. it is a human right um, and it's absolutely the choice of the person who's pregnant what to do. Mm -hmm. That's why consent is important because once you are having sex, yeah. you know some of the outcomes of sex is a possible infection, it's a possible yeah. pregnancy, Maybe you'll injure yourself because of, you know, the fancy yeah, styles you sure. are doing. <laughs> the question is, what's going to, who's responsible of getting the condom? Who's responsible, you know, to, to, to make sure that all of those things are sorted so that mm -hmm. when I do get pregnant mm -hmm. and I don't want to be pregnant and I don't want to keep the pregnancy, mm -hmm. we've had a discussion. You may not like it. You mm -hmm. don't have to like it. It's my body. Mm -hmm. But I know that these conversations happen within relationships. It's not like, uh, you know, people are just saying, oh, I'm pregnant and I want to be pregnant. I'm just going. No, mm -hmm. people are invested in their relationships. They want to talk to their partners about these decisions. You know, yeah. it's understanding that you can't impede or impose your own choices on someone once sure. they've decided on a particular thing. And they should be able to have it safely, in dignity, timelessly, because, you know, our legislation has a time bound. Yeah. Um, and, and it has to be done with people who are healthcare workers, who are trained, who know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. So in the U.S., sure. the, the U.S. is a, the particular one because um, of interest is that there was the court case, um, oh, yeah. yeah, the Roe v. Wade, Wade yeah. and the Supreme Court of the United States um, rolled back and mm -hmm. took away the right that yeah. was protected mm -hmm. at that level um, by Roe v. Wade decision. Mm -hmm. And I actually submitted an amicus brief in that court case as a third party intervener is in it? my role as the U.N. Yeah, okay. and so part you believe that is an egregious attack on 
human dignity. Absolutely, and human it is. And it's also gendered and it's racialized, mm-hmm. right? Because even here in South Africa and Africa, even in the United States, it's still black women who are dying preventable maternal deaths. Mm-hmm. And so when you add the fact that many of the unsafe abortions we talk about death, but people mm-hmm. end up with disabilities. People end up with chronic pain. People end up losing their job because they have yeah. to be off from work for some surgical intervention that would have not been needed had they just received the care they needed from a professional the first time, you mm-hmm. know? So there, there are lots of other costs. And for black women who work in already low paying jobs, mm-hmm. jobs with no security, mm-hmm. jobs with no labor protections, sure. no sick leave, you are still the primary caregiver at home. Mm-hmm. How do we expect that those people must still mm-hmm. pull up a fight to mm-hmm. make decisions about their bodies for yeah. the benefit of everybody else, by the way? Yeah. Right? So it's important to understand that the autonomy, my right to make decisions about my body and self-determine mm-hmm. lies within me. Mm-hmm. But the state, non-state actors, religion, or everyone yeah. thinks that they can remove that individual right of women and mm-hmm. located outside of us through mm-hmm. religion or culture or the law or whatever. Yeah. And it's only peculiar because it only happens to women and only around abortion and sex work rights. Mm. When you are a cardiothoracic surgeon and you need your heart bypass, no one sits and says, give me the itinerary of all the bad food you were sure. eating. And then I'll decide. Mm-hmm if you were eating well and that you you didn't get hypertension and diabetes Mm -hmm. and all of this because of your bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And so because you made bad eating decisions, you are not getting this heart transplant. (laughs) It's unfair. But we do that to women every day. Yeah, We say you must be good women first. Then you can. It doesn't Mm -hmm. work that way. Yeah. Let's move now to your book. In 2021, you published a book titled Dr. T. (laughs) Uh, A Guide to Sexual Health and Pleasure. Uh, It must be very exciting. I went through it and uh, I saw some, you know, exciting (laughs) You were blushing. (laughs) Yeah, talk us through the book. Uh, What informed the book and what is it all about? What can people learn from it? So the book was inspired by ordinary women in South Africa Mm -hmm. who had been reading my columns and listening to me on radio and and, and television. Mm -hmm. And I'd meet them and say, just write a book, man. I wish my my sister heard that. I wish my mom would have heard that. I wish my daughter would oh, have yeah, heard yeah, that. I yeah, wish yeah. I had heard that when I was yeah. young. Mm-hmm. And so that's really what made me take the time to write the book. I think the book was always there somewhere at the back of my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, but it has it hadn't become an actual thing. Mm-hmm. And so I think based on that kind of feedback and those kinds of requests, I thought, well, you know what, let me just be brave and do this. And so the, the first part of the book is dedicated to health, Uh, physiology, explaining the anatomy and the body and trying to destigmatize, right? The way that we understand how our bodies work, what menstruation means and and all of the different options available, Uh, but also puberty, right? A lot of- So sex education. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of us, especially as young girls, you know, we are already- taught when you are little sit properly oh, yeah, don't yeah, jump yeah. don't go on the tree because your dress is short you know like those are sure. subliminal messages like think is there something wrong with me mm-hmm. is this because i'm a girl is it you know so you so there's a lot of unlearning and reconnecting with ourselves that mm-hmm. also need to happen for us as women mm-hmm. um and so part of that first part of the book is that is to give people new ideas of how to reconnect with their body but give yeah. them information as well yeah. of how things work yeah let's talk about uh, consent it's mm-hmm. part of the chapters in the book. What 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 can we learn about mm-hmm. consent? Because we live in a society where, uh, time and again, we we hear stories about uh, a man having raped a woman because there was no consent in the act. How do we? How, what does really consent mean? Mm-hmm. You are so correct. And the, mm. the middle section of the part is on sexual pleasure. That's uh-huh. the okay. best part. Yeah. <laughs> but I started with consent mm-hmm. in that pleasure section mm-hmm. because sex by definition is pleasurable and enjoyable and consensual. Okay. So for me to talk about sexual pleasure in the chapter, mm. I had to locate it within consensual interactions because otherwise it's no longer sex and it's no longer pleasurable. And there are names for it, like you said, rape, sexual harassment, sexual Mm -hmm. assault, all Mm -hmm. of those. And I wanted the book to be a space where we can learn about our bodies, learn 
interpersonal relationships, learn yeah. how to negotiate the kind of sex that we want, mm -hmm. but also be affirmed that these bodies of ours are first and foremost ours. And secondly, that they are pleasurable mm -hmm. for us as well as the oh, people yeah, yeah, whose yeah, these yeah, bodies yeah. are. Um, and that by the time you have sex with someone, whether it's someone has a penis or that person has a vagina, mm -hmm. that's a different story. Okay. But you need to be affirmed in yourself, mm -hmm. knowing that I can say yes or no to a particular interaction I don't like. And I often talk about consent beyond just the act of sex itself. Okay. Can I hold your hand? Can I touch you here? Can I kiss you here? Right? You are learning the other person. They are learning so you. So you should ask well, if I can kiss. Absolutely. Absolutely. You don't and just then kiss they, your girlfriend. No. Then she might say, <laughs> yes, and I like it this way. <laughs> but it? if you just kiss her, she's just going to be like, oh, oh, we, oh, he's kissing me. Okay. She's not part so of that. if I come back from work, I go home, do I need to ask for a hug? Do I need to ask for a kiss? I need to ask for sex? I need to ask. We need to <laughs> get consent. Yeah, we need to get to a point where yeah. as a society in general, we understand consent full stop. Okay. And consent for everything. Mm -hmm. Everything, even outside of sex. And in the book I speak about that to say, yes, it's about consent for sex, but mm -hmm. we are so entitled. We have such a culture of deep entitlement to people's space and energy and bodies oh, yes. that we just take and take and 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 we we break people's boundaries and then we get upset that they find that uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So just to get into the habit of saying, actually, I need to know if this is okay with you. Like, can I mm -hmm. give you a hug? You, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's okay. a, And I know it sounds odd. You know why? Because we were not taught it. Sure. But just because we don't, no, we're we not taught it, it doesn't mean yeah, we can't learn yeah, new sure. ways of being each other. Look at us how we are in traffic. Mm -hmm. Someone waves and takes their hand out to just show you that I thought I was going left, but actually I need to go right. Sure it turns into a whole thing of road rage. Road rage yeah. They yield sign. Go say LA. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even say stop. It just says yield, yield. for the person on your oh, right. Yeah, we yeah. can't even yield in a traffic light. Mm. We can't even yield in a circle. So for me, it's about the state of us as a people first. And I located it within sexual pleasure because a lot of the times when you think of women, you think rape, rape victims, disempowered mm -hmm. and i'm saying in this book pleasure is a revolutionary act mm. in this context Amanda. where we are, where we are being raped in the <laughs> ways that we cool. are yeah. understanding our bodies claiming mm. our autonomy mm -hmm. knowing how things work knowing what i like sexually sure. and not like and being able to tell that to my partner mm -hmm. it should not be revolutionary but it is because that's the context we are right now mm -hmm. should it be revolutionary in 2 years should this book be needed maybe not I would hope not, but yes. the truth is it will still be needed because we don't get right information. So yes, if, for example, if I'm starting a new relationship with you, mm -hmm. I would absolutely appreciate it mm -hmm. if you asked me, can I give you a hug? And you know, my response would be yes, and this is where I like it. Oh, there's a way or, of hugging. You don't just yeah, hug. You don't just, but you see, when you <laughs> hug me, you are hugging me. Yes. I'm not involved in sure. that thing. Mm -hmm. But if we are in a relationship and we are trying to build something together, we mm -hmm. both need to be participants in sure. what it is that you are trying to build. That's why people will be married for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the ladies will love us. Hey, Nando's chicken, hella. I'm glad it's over and, and I carry yeah, on with my sure. life. Because she's not an active participant in that. And 20 years later, because he thinks that sex starts sky erection sex and sky ejaculation What's happening in between? Who's saying what to who? Is it nice? Must I keep going? Must I turn around? Must I stop a little bit? Mm -hmm. Must conversation, talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Because that still says to you, you are wanted here. Mm -hmm. This is lovely for both of us. If mm -hmm. I want to change, I'll say, ah, so, so, or whatever. So, then there's no catastrophe because we yeah. are talking. But I have a sabui. Get eight tetas. Hey, and I was like, hey, you <laughs> that thing. Who taught you that thing? Sure, because yeah. now it's like you are surprised when you are shocked. Oh. Yeah. It needs to be a conversation. It needs uh -huh. to be a continuous thing uh -huh. that you are investing it. Sure. And trust me, uh -huh. couples who can't communicate, and have good sex, mm -hmm. they can't do much else in their relationship. And that's why people will come to me as Dr. Tlaleng mm -hmm. and say, oh, our sex is so bad. But when I listen to them, I'm like, no, man, this couple has financial problems. <laughs> <laughs> what makes up a good Their finances sex, the are way? now <laughs> affecting the bedroom. Is it? You see? I'm like, ah, these guys are not having agreements on 
the kinds of values and ethos, right? Mm-hmm. For their home and their household and how to raise their kids. Mm-hmm. And you know, I've referred people enough for marriage counseling. That has nothing to do. Yeah, but literally speaking, technically speaking, mm-hmm. you guys are having sex. Yeah. Has the problem. You love each other. Mm-hmm. You find each other hot. No problem. Mm-hmm. Why Lily Mo? No, because I feel belittled. I feel that my opinions don't matter. I feel that this and this and the other thing. Mm-hmm. How can or why? Because when we went shopping, or when this one did this thing, or when my mother-in-law came and then yeah. I'm like, okay, you see that this has nothing to do with sex. Mm-hmm. But because it's affecting the sex life, mm-hmm. where one party is now saying, ah, okay. then they say we have a sex problem. But all the other dysfunction and chaos in their lives was normalized. But okay. the minute the man can no longer get the sex he wants when he wants it, how he wants it. Ah, uh-uh, we must go to the doctor. There's something wrong with you, mm. and so that is the the fundamental thing in a kiro yeah. We need to relate very differently as people, our interpersonal relationships, sure. and we need to value ourselves more than the fact that I have a penis that oh, can get erect, uh-huh. that can go into a vagina, that will eject. If that that can't be the sum total mm-hmm. of your definition of manhood or of who you so, are. Yeah. So in a nutshell, sex is not about a penis. Um, getting inside a vagina. It could be a vagina with a vagina. Oh. It could be a penis with another penis. Oh. It could so there's be, more to it. There's a lot more to it. Is it? But we can't unlock that. Okay. Because when how fit are you? Today, what do you feel like? You know? Yeah. Hey, I've hey, you know, just I've got extra ten minutes nyana before work. So get to have a my baby. Quick I get like that because you are gonna accuse me of being promiscuous. Oh yeah. So there's tension, there's anxiety, there's a level of, you know, uncertainty, and it will spill over into every aspect of your life. And mm-hmm. why comprehensive sexuality education is not about sex? And I always say this to parents. It's about teaching children to communicate, teaching them who to go to when what they don't want being done to them happens. Mm-hmm. It's about you believing your child, mm-hmm. right? It's about you respecting them enough when they say, Mm-mm, I don't feel like drinking that drink. Can I have water instead? Your child is exercising autonomy. They are saying in my body right now, I would rather have this than that. You say, okay, have that. Okay. It's fine. You are affirming that they can listen to their intuition. But if you punish your children for saying, oh, I don't want this one, I want this one. Mm-hmm. Every time that comes, that feeling comes. Mm-hmm. And the plus I must not climb trees. And yeah. that day I wanted a peach. Yeah. I really wanted that peach. And that's the day I climbed the tree. Mm-hmm. So it must be my fault. Mm. Do you see how all these different so conversations... So uh, what other acts forms or uh, constitute to sex apart from penetration <laughs> and i want you want our sexual offenses act ne? yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was very clear mm-hmm. any person using any bo- organ or any object mm-hmm. into an orifice mm-hmm. any orifice on anyone's body it's a problem okay. without consent mm-hmm. So if you want to participate in oral sex, Mm -hmm. you must ask for consent because it is an organ, it's a body part that's going into another orifice on someone else's body. It Mm -hmm. may be oral sex. Mm -hmm. You still need consent. People are very kinky out there Mm -hmm. and they're very experimental and they do all sorts of things. And maybe for them, they're experimenting with how erogenous their ears are. Mm-hmm. And maybe someone is using something or a body organ mm-hmm. around the ear. Now, now what must happen? Consent. Sure. Any body, any orifice, any body part, any object. Wow. Talk us through, uh, there's something called stealthing. Mm-hmm. When a couple are engaged in a sexual act and obviously using protection and then someone decides to stealth. Uh, is that a crime? So the nice thing about consent is that it's in, it's ongoing, mm-hmm. it's affirmative, mm-hmm. and we can decide when we want to stop. Mm-hmm. So sex doesn't have to stop at ejaculation. We can actually oh, be like, yeah. you know what, we've actually, this was quite nice. Mm-hmm. And and it ends. And we're like, yeah, we're happy with that. Mm-hmm. Part of the consent is negotiating the conditions of sex. Oh, the conditions. Yes. How it happens. Not that we are just 
yeah. having sex. Okay. How it part. happens, mm-hmm. where it happens. When when are we going to stop? Because it may very well that we will stop when you ejaculate. But can we at least discuss that that's where we're stopping? <laughs> or but after if, you you but, ejaculate, are yeah. you going to still do things to me so that I can also have my orgasm? So what if it drops before you... There's a lot of things you can do with a flaccid penis. Say again? There's a lot of things you can do with a flaccid penis okay. that is not erect. Oh, okay. So the obsession with erect penises is part of what I would love to change about men and masculinity and sexual performance mm-hmm. and how they view themselves. Mm-hmm. Because the only time you guys come to me at the clinic is because my penis is not as erect as it used to be. Oh. That's the number one complaint. But I digress. Mm-hmm. Still thing is important because part of consent is that you should be able to co- communicate about condom use. No condom use. Mm-hmm. Why are we not using a condom? If we are using a condom, who's going to buy the condom? Where is it going to come from? Maybe you have some in the car. Maybe I have some in my bag. Mm-hmm. Where, is, where is the literal condom going to come? Right? Mm-hmm. Then we decide, okay, we have a condom. Here's the condom. And the most common condom is which one? The guys, the ones that men use, right? The one that goes on a penis. Okay. And it's now called the external condom, by the way. Yeah. That condom has to be put on properly for it to work. Sure. It can burst. Mm-hmm. It can fall off. It can maybe not even come on properly at all. Mm-hmm. And then it's an awkward idea. No, it's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But be prepared for that. Laugh at that. Make light of that. It happens. Oh, Help yeah. each other put the condom on, right? Mm-hmm. That's why in sexuality education, everyone must know how a pad works. Everyone must know how a tampon works. Everyone must know how a condom works because to Tusana at some point with mm-hmm. these things. Mm-hmm. And so still thing is when you guys have decided we are going to have sex and this person is going to put the condom on. Okay. You start having sex and that person who's meant to have had the condom on removes it mm-hmm. without telling mm-hmm. you that I want to remo- remove the condom. Is it okay? Mm-hmm. That's the problem. It gets removed. Yeah. The other person realizes, hold on, I've just had sex without a condom, but we had agreed that we are going to use a condom. Mm-hmm. And that's what still thing is. It's the removal of a condom during sexual activity without telling the other person yeah. and getting their consent to do so. Yeah. And there is there are instances where you find that men buy alcohol for ladies. And then the next morning, ladies wake up and then they they claim money. And because the guy does not give the lady the money that she's asking for, then despite that she has already consented for the sex, the sex right? Because now she has not received the money she's claiming. Therefore, she goes and opens a case and says and claims that, well, not claim, but says she's been raped. How do we deal with that? Is that rape? Yes, there was consent. Yes, we're going to have sex. We had fun and everything. But we never agreed that I'm going to give you money. But the next morning you come <laughs> and ask for money. How do we deal with that? Mm. Is that rape? So I want to deal with it in two parts. So okay. the first part is there's so much actual rape happening mm-hmm. that for us to even come up with different hypothetical situations, yeah. it, it, it's not helping the actual rape victims, sure. right? But here's why that's important for a South African context where Mm -hmm. sex work is criminalized, Mm -hmm. right? But also in a context where men think by getting you alcohol, wherever, that you then will go home with them and have sex with them or have sex Mm -hmm. with them in the car. Mm -hmm. I want to ask Majita one thing. When Lena is Majita by each other beers, why does I expect that uh, you are going to have sex later with each other? No, it's not about sex. Angeles, no. no, no, no. You bought girls <laughs> you alcohol. You my bag, I scratch yours. Hey, but you bought, you bought girls alcohol, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And because you were buying them alcohol, there is this added layer of expectation. Yeah. As Majita, Mukhudu Monday, mm-hmm. you are buying each other beers. Mm-hmm. Why do you guys not have an expectation that as Majita, as, yeah. as friends, Haritwamu, yeah, we are going to have sex because you were buying your friend yeah. beers. I think, I must say for free, I think it's wrong to expect that a lady must sleep with you because you bought them alcohol. That's 
That's very yeah. wrong. But I have a problem with ladies who would claim money from you. Yeah, let's go. We are going step by step. <laughs> sure. We're going step by okay, So sure, I get we've we've dis- we've okay. agreed that sure. that's out of order. It is, yes. When you look at consent, sometimes people will just be quiet. Mm-hmm. Sometimes someone will be visibly like in shock. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's not so visible, but they are clearly not into mm-hmm. this. In a society that then supports that expectation that if Majida buys you drinks, you will do this with us. Mm-hmm. As a person who then had drinks mm-hmm. in a club full of men and other men, in a society that you know you are already less powerful, mm-hmm. what are the chances that I can stand up to you in your group of Majida and say, actually, I <laughs> not just lies. <laughs> Right? Sure. What are the chances with mm-hmm. the levels of violence we know exist in South Africa, mm-hmm. even with interpersonal relationships? What are mm-hmm. the chances that I will go with you in your car, having already not been sure I could even say no? Remember, I'm already mm-hmm. in the car, but I'm sure. like, Ish, I wish I didn't get into this car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get to your place, mm-hmm. your place. Mm-hmm. You think in, that's the place where I'll say, no, I don't want this. I'm confident. I know my rights. Never. In reality, you are already fearful. Mm-hmm. You are already vulnerable, right? You already know, even if you scream, but I don't care. I don't care. I say new girl every day. But not these girls, do they not see? But I have a game. So we need to think. So all of that, and, and that's why we need to change the whole of society mm-hmm. so that we, we remove the kind of template that we are all just operating in. Mm-hmm. And to be honest with you, People who are sex workers are criminalized sure. in this country. Mm-hmm. So me and you now, Titus, mm-hmm. can't go into a conversation openly, clearly, boldly that says we are going to negotiate. I'm a sex worker. Oh, yeah. Right? Even if we go and I'm go guy guy, it's fine. But mm-hmm. nah, I'm at work. Mm-hmm. How many women are confident to say that? Almost zero. Right? Mm-hmm. Sex workers are there and they work in groups, they work you know, in communities where there fam- there's familiarity yes. to protect even themselves mm-hmm. from just random people not understanding that these are workers and they're sex workers and they're here because they are working. Mm-hmm. What sure. So we need to decriminalize sex work for that other reason as well. Okay. So that we can be empowered to say, actually, we're now going to go to my house. from your house. Or are going to go to my house. anybody. <laughs> and then you think you you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's it's both. And I and I'll be honest with you, I've mm-hmm. also dealt with cases mm-hmm. of extortion. Sure. So we shouldn't even try and pretend like that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. It happens. Sure. Where people will um ask you for your nudes, they will ask you for your video, they'll ask you, and then next thing, if you don't pay me this much amount of money, I'm sure. gonna do this. So mm-hmm. sex as a thing, sex and sexual content as and mm-hmm. humans is as pleasurable and fun and joyful. Mm-hmm as it is harmful and violent and used as a tool, Mm -hmm. like many other areas of our lives, which is why then the understanding of what consent is and to be deliberate in changing the interactions we have on an interpersonal level is very important Mm -hmm. so that we can have pleasurable good sex. By definition, sex is consensual. Anything else is no longer sex, right? And only with people who can consent. Sure. Not when you are drunk. Even when I'm drunk in my age, I can't consent. Even Mm -hmm. if I say yes. Mm -hmm. So you can't then wake up Titus and say, but I bought you drinks and you said yes. I can't say yes when I'm drunk. I can't say yes when I'm drunk. The same way if a 13 year old says yes to sex, it's still not consent. It's not consent because they are below the age of consent. And in Mm -hmm. South Africa, it went a step further and said, your peer. Because mm-hmm. remember, kids are holding hands, they are kissing, they are doing all sorts of things. They're inquisitive about life and themselves. Mm-hmm. And what used to happen and still happens in many countries, yeah. if two, maybe it's a 13-year-old and a 14-year-old mm-hmm. are caught just, you know, when you steal a kiss, sure. they get thrown into jail. Is that it? still happens. But what yeah. South Africa did was, if you are my peer, and a peer is someone two years within mm-hmm. my age group, yeah. but not more than uh, yeah. 17, yeah. no one is going to throw you into jail. Mm-hmm. What we will do, though, mm-hmm. Hopefully, you are in a school, you are in a community with parents who can give mm-hmm. you the support to say, hey, we saw you, uh, you know, <laughs> what do you know about sex? What sure. do you know about this? Why should you delay? Mm-hmm. Why is it important for you? I mean, mm-hmm. my mother asked me, she never sure. said, don't have sex. Mm-hmm. She says, why do you think you can have 
afford to be pregnant right now. Mm-hmm. I say, oh, I want I want to go to school. I want to finish this okay. Yeah. So what are you going to do about it? Yeah. So <laughs> doc as we wind up, what's the importance of uh you know sexual positions I see here on page 183? Eighty-three. Oh, is it one hundred and eighty-three? Hey, it, you are fast. Yeah. <laughs> There are so many pages, but you found that one. <laughs> on eighty-three, it talks about sex, sexual positions. What's, what's the, the the importance of sexual posi- positions uh, during sex or sexual intercourse? It's important um, because remember, sex has different phases. You've got oh. the the pre, you know, the the simmering phase where you still. Oh. Trying to feed each other up and exactly, and, all, yeah. and then you've got the actual sexual contact, and that one I say there are genitals involved, right? Oh, all right, like penis, a vagina, yeah. a vagina to a vagina, a penis uh-huh. to a penis, a penis to an <laughs> anus. Who knows? Anything is possible. <laughs> sure, <laughs> a sex toy, by the way, right? Oh. People love using sex toys as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all of that is happening, and you all are having lots of fun, and then you get to a point in the sex itself where either you have a climax i have one mm-hmm. maybe there's three of us or four of us whoever mm-hmm. has one mm-hmm. and then the sex kind of ends so the positions are a way of adding excitement mm-hmm. um to to sex um during foreplay you sure. may find that um there may be more positions mm-hmm. that are more enjoyable at oh, yeah, yeah. S- certain stages mm-hmm. of of um of having sex. Yeah. Some people have injuries, some people have back injuries, some people have hip injuries, oh. some people have an ankle injury, yeah. <laughs> some people may have a shoulder injury, and yeah. you may need to be creative in yeah, how sure. you accommodate Creativity. each other's needs, <laughs> right? Sure. Um and you may have a special chair or a special cushion or a special couch that's all dep- and again, you won't mm-hmm. get there if you're not talking. Oh, yeah. You won't get there if you're not communicating. You 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 can't even add the pleasure of lubricants and sex toys and all yeah. of these if you are not talking. Yeah. So it's there to get people to be like, sure. oh, she yeah. put them in there. Yes, I did. Yeah. But it's to also just give you ideas of oh, how yeah, to yeah. make things, um, you well, know, yeah. nice and creative, creative and like, you and know, enjoyable. You, yeah, yeah, you go about dry yeah. humping and say, I want to stimulate. I want it to be different. Absolutely. Yeah. Now I want us to uh, focus on. Uh, homosexuality, same uh, sex marriage and all that type of setup, uh, and also to get your sense what you make of uh, the Ugandan uh, anti-gay law. You were in seven, the the president mm-hmm. <laughs> just uh, signed into law the bill that will, you know, criminalize uh, same uh, sex mm-hmm. uh, marriage. What what is your take on that? And do you think uh, it should be repealed? It absolutely should be repealed, um, mm-hmm. and in the different interventions available for me through the UN, mm-hmm. um, have made you know yeah. such public uh, uh, pronouncements on that, mm-hmm. and um, I mean they've gone way beyond, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, what is what makes sense to to sure. anybody. I think it's also important to realize that the Africa continent and former colonies are still having laws. Yeah. And they have embedded practices and ideas mm-hmm. on what Africanness is, based on the perverted ideas of colonizers. Sure. And we have leaders now in Africa who may mm. be our skin folk, mm. but their ideas about freedom are not about freeing everybody. Sure. It's about them being in power mm-hmm. and having people to dominate. And the people mm-hmm. they want to dominate is women and girls and gay people. Yeah. And so my idea of freedom is. The true autonomy and true ability to self-determine, yeah. and having elected leaders create communities and societies that are possible for us to thrive in that manner. And what mm-hmm. is happening um, in 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 other countries as well, by the way, there's different proposals. Previously in Ghana, mm-hmm. um, there'll be new ones um, that I can't mention yet, but we know some of the bills are in the in the sure. pipeline. Mm-hmm. It's that you then have these these so-called black men leaders who are perpetuating colonial racist mm-hmm. ideas about womanhood about oh, yeah. homosexuality mm-hmm. the key principles of human rights of non-discrimination equality meaningful participation accountability mm. are applicable across the board mm-hmm. and you can't call something an african sure when it's so directly linked mm-hmm. to my dignity mm-hmm. and my humanness sure. and a lot of what's happening yeah. across the continent is dehumanizing and dehumanizing of gay people dehumanizing of women of girls leads to 
a place where violence can happen upon them mm. and there will be no consequence. And that's why we are worried. That's why yeah. these are human rights issues because mm-hmm. we know the implications are such mm-hmm. that they will affect economic, civil, political, um, cultural rights um, yeah. of, of the of the yeah. people targeted. And sure, we, we respect the their sovereignty as, as you know, independent countries, but obviously uh, the basic human rights shouldn't be trampled upon. Yeah, human rights are yeah. indivisible sure. and, and they don't, you know, they, yeah. they are what they are and they are, we can't negotiate on human yeah. rights. Yeah, absolutely. Doc, we are in the festive season um, from the health uh, perspective. Mm-hmm. What should people do uh, to keep in good health, um, either physical and mental health? I think mental health is a big one for us. I think we've gone through a lot um, sure. as a as a people, um, actually for many years now, but sure. every year seems to feel a little mm. harder than the previous. Mm-hmm. And it's just to be honest in that um, within ourselves. And I, I know I say this, that, you know, not many people have access to professionals to help them sure. um, even just speak and articulate mm-hmm. what they're feeling. Mm-hmm. Many of us know what we are feeling is not great. We're not in a good space. Mm-hmm but we don't have the support of a professional to assist us in 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 that unpacking that um and then healing so mm-hmm. we are just stuck always in this turmoilous place of just uneasiness anxiety and and then deep sense of worry and that um we are living in tough times sure. like that is the truth you know and and I don't have a magic bullet around uh-huh. mental health and what people must do i can't say go and take a walk we don't have land where must people walk we don't have land. Sure, Where must people walk? So I can't even say that, right? Mm-hmm. I can't say let children play in the streets and where, which streets must they play because they are spilling over with sewage, mm-hmm. you know? So for me, it's it's a hard question because it gets very personal um, and, and, and it, it makes me sad um, almost. And I don't want to close on a sad note, <laughs> sure. uh, but maybe just to say that our, our thoughts are valid, our feelings mm-hmm. are valid and mm-hmm. that we... We, we are valid in wanting better yeah. for ourselves yeah. um, as a people and that indeed um, you can't extinguish the human desire to be free mm-hmm. and that's freedom in all sense of the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and as an advocate for universal uh, health care, uh, next year South Africa is going into elections in 2024, national and provincial elections. Uh, from your perspective, what do you think should change, uh, particularly looking at the health uh, system of South Africa? We need more sustainable financing that mm-hmm. will actually give us new facilities. Mm-hmm. Actual numbers need to increase. We need to make sure that we are maintaining and bringing up to speed in terms of the science and the technology of existing facilities. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness, we need to make sure that we train our healthcare workers well, but that we employ them and make sure that their working environment yeah. is fair, is healthy, and is safe. Because yeah. remember... My working environment as a doctor or a nurse Mm -hmm. is your healing environment as a patient. So my wish is that we no longer see each other as patient and and or uh, patient and Mm -hmm. nurse or doctor as conflicted or at war with each other, Mm -hmm. but that we need to be holding each other to hold the government accountable to ensure that your healthy healing environment Mm -hmm. becomes a reality because that is my healthy working environment. So as a parting shot, Doc, uh, have you registered to vote? Are you looking forward to 2024? Yes, I have been a registered voter for a while now. Mm -hmm. And I did make sure that my address is updated and all my information is correct. So all of the young people, follow Dr. T's lead. Make sure sure that you are registered. And by the way, you can still uh, do it online, Online, even though the the drive of the weekend um, is done. And I think what's important is to realize that we need to bet on Mm -hmm. ourselves as Mm -hmm. as young South Africans. Maybe I'm not so young. I'm an elder youth. I'm an elder youth. Uh, So let's bet on ourselves. Let's bet on a future that we want to create for ourselves. And um, I suppose as is with my life and my career, I always bet on the underdog. Mm -hmm. And I feel like as young people right now in South Africa, we are the underdog. So I'm betting on us. I'm betting on us. showing up and doing um, our best uh, to contribute to our democracy because that's one big contribution we can make Mm -hmm. is to show up and it's to vote. Yeah. And I mean, voting obviously is the cornerstone of our democracy. Now, where can people get uh, this book? People can get my book um, at 
trusted bookstores. Oh, okay. <laughs> Bargain books um, mm-hmm. usually has lots of copies. If they don't have a copy at exclusive books, ask yeah. them to order one for you. Sure. Uh, but also online, take mm-hmm. a lot. Um, always has sure. nice specials as well. Yeah. So definitely, yeah. I must uh, urge everyone to have a copy of this book. Quite in- insightful, and thank you very much, Doc, for coming thank through you. and for being part of this conversation. We have learned quite a lot. Uh, oh. It was just a breath of fresh air having a doctor providing much insight. Superior logic. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. This was Thank lovely. You. Thank you very much. We've come, we have come to the end of uh, today's episode, ladies and gentlemen. Remember to go to our YouTube and subscribe to the EFF YouTube uh, channel for all the latest on the EFF uh, podcast. And uh, my name is Titus Tungu. Until we meet again, good day. Kanemambu. Stand up, South Africa. Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run, South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a covert thing.